Hey everyone and welcome back to another video from Oman Talks NRL Supercoach. In today's video, going through the round two trade targets, burning questions and overall preview, tackling the hot topics of the week. So hopefully if you guys enjoyed the video, really appreciate a thumbs up. Do please consider subscribing to the channel as well if you haven't already and let's get straight into it. So it goes without saying that round one was pretty crazy in terms of the point scoring that we saw. It was very low compared to what we had seen in 2021. And so I think the rage trade, you know, the, the trigger happiness of the trade button is really prevalent. I think I've seen in the Twitter community and also on um, forums as well. But I wanted to kind of emphasize that there's no need to rage trade when we're still trying to figure out who the best options are. We're still trying to process information and reassess players as well. And the round one score due to the price change mechanism is actually the least important in terms of uh, predicting the future price changes. So hopefully looking at this graphic here, you can kind of get a sense of that. The price changes are based on a three-game rolling average. So the first price change will happen after rounds three, but then come round four, that round one score is going to drop out. But in comparison, the round two score will be there for two rounds, and the round three score would actually be in three price change calculations. So really round two and three are much more important for future price changes. So if you have a gun player who scored low in the first round, don't worry about that as much. I think what's more important is the round two score for the price changes. And hopefully this little bit of information in the back of your mind hopefully does ease the kind of need to rage trade. And on the discussion of trades, I wanted to also give a quick segment on prioritizing trades. So this question came from Husey FPL on my Twitter. So his question was, would you rather trade out Brandon Smith and another injured player or Brandon Smith and Cody Walker? Now, I think it's an interesting question because uh, it, there's always a, the mentality I'm going to try to adopt for this season is to try to focus on the weak link. Now, the weak link is probably going to be your injured players, and especially if it's an injured player who's got high value. So Brandon Smith, for example, who's almost 600K, that's an easy sell in my opinion because that's a lot of money that you can use elsewhere in your team to beef up other positions. Cody Walker is a slightly different one that, that he's fit, he's playing, but he has got a tough draw and he is very expensive at 730K. Now, the question is, you know, do you take out Cody Walker or would you prioritize another injured player? I think it comes down to the value of that other injured player. If that other injured player is, say, like Valet from the Warriors, 205k, I know it sounds crazy that you would not prioritize selling the injured player, but I actually think there's more value in selling Cody Walker at that high price when you can go for another proven gun in Munster, and that still actually generates you cash. But in this particular instance, I would actually go with selling Cody Walker instead of that injured player, especially because that injured player, if you don't have a lot of money in the bank and you don't have a lot of options to move to, I think you can get better value out of that trade going down to say like a Munster who's got a much better draw. Um, and getting that spare money to upgrade the rest of your team. So it's a bit of an interesting question. It's a good question, I think, in terms of you know focusing on the weak links, you know trading out injured players versus your guns. My broad statement would be try to focus on the injured players. But when you've got instances where you've got a gun player like Cody Walker, who's very expensive with a tough draw, I think you can make certain exceptions. So the first topic of the week that I wanted to cover was forward cheapies, both in the front row forward and also some in the second row forward. Now, I think there's quite a few players who kind of fall into this category. So the ones that I thought about were Jermaine Tanua Brown, Spencer Lenu, because he's just been named to start for the Panthers, Ethan Bullimore, Josh King, and Fletcher Baker. So I'll go through quickly each player as to why I've got them as a consideration. So Jermaine Tanua Brown, not necessarily a consideration to buy, but maybe one that people are looking to sell. So he did get the starting role last week, but he's obviously now injured for what it looks like one to two weeks. Now, obviously, Peyton as well has had a bit of a uh, track record with rotating his forward. And I think people are starting to lose faith in, you know, whether we can trust any of the forward players, you know, seeing what he's done with Tamalolo. So in terms of moving him off to say like a Spencer Lenu, Bullimore, King or Baker, Spencer Lenu, I think starting, I'm still not super keen on, even though now that Moses Leota has got a, what looks like an eight week injury. Lenu, even when he was starting last season, he wasn't playing big minutes. His minutes were staying the same, around 33 to 35 minutes, and he was punching out around 30 to 35 points as well. At that price tag of 258k, just not sure how much value you're going to get out of him. And I think he's definitely one that I would definitely wait a week uh, before I would try to buy in rounds two, because I think you want to get a better sense of the kind of minutes he's going to play. But in general, the Panthers forwards, apart from say like Isaiah Yo, they tend to rotate a, a little bit, um, at least especially in the prop position, you know, with uh, Leota, Fisher Harris, uh, Lenu, um, Matt Eisenhuth, they do tend to rotate quite a bit. So I'm not sure how much output you're going to get out of Spencer Lenu. So my early thoughts is that the ceiling is going to be quite low and I'm not sure how much cash generation you're going to get. So I definitely would not advise to be jumping on him straight away. Definitely would want to wait a week before I get on him. 
Bullimore, slightly different question in the sense that he's got a good score under his belt, so potentially for cash generation, it could be a little bit better. But as we discussed, round one is the least relevant for future price changes. So I also want to see um, in the next couple of weeks as well, or at least one more week um, for sure, you know, what the output is going to be like. The benefit with Bullimore is that he is front row forward and second row forward listed. It also depends on the return date of Schuster. Now, if it's only six weeks that Schuster is going to be out, so we say, say we expect he's going to come back rounds five or round six. I just don't know how much extra cash generation you're going to get out of Bullimore. And so I'd be a bit more confident in Bullimore than, say, over a Spencer Linu. Just playing on the edge, maybe there's some attacking upside there. We saw him get a try already in that game. And the output was not bad. 45 points in base from the 80 minutes that he played. So I think he's a little bit more safer as an option than, say, a Lenu. But again, I think if you can avoid getting him uh, this week, maybe it's best to wait another week to see how he goes. Josh King is an interesting one because obviously with injuries now to Christian Welch for the season and Brandon Smith for several weeks, it means that there are definitely minutes on offer in that storm forward rotation. Josh King has been named to start again for the second week in a row. Last week, his minutes were inflated a little bit, given that Brandon Smith went down in like the first five minutes, I think it was. So King played 64 minutes and he had 45 points in base. Now he did get minus four points in negative um, stats there. So that's why his total score is 41. 45 points in base um, in 64 minutes playing in the middle is fine. It's not amazing, but I have a better confidence in him, I think, in his starting role or at least his minutes moving forward just because of those significant long-term injuries to um, Christian Welsh and it looks like Smith is going to be out for quite a few weeks as well. So I've got a bit more confidence in Josh King. A bit of a downside maybe is that PPM Playing in the middle, you'd probably hope that, that PPM is a little bit higher. But with King, he's a little bit cheaper as well than the likes of a Bullimore. One potential move I am thinking about is maybe Jermaine Tenor Brown down to Josh King just to create some extra funds. You know, if King produces scores in that mid-50s range, I'd be happy enough with that um, out of a 256k option. And so I've got, a more, I've got a bit more confidence, I think, picking King than, say, a Lenu or a Bullimore because I feel his place in the team is going to be a little bit longer. Now, Fletcher Baker is an interesting one. At 267k, he was named to start off the bench for the Roosters. He's only listed at 2RF, but if he was named continually at that starting prop position, then he would get that second row forward and front row forward dual flexibility added. Now, the base output was pretty good, 42 in base from just the 33 minutes. So the best thing about him compared to some of these other options here, he definitely had the best PPM and the best output. I guess the question is, he's named on the bench. Is he going to keep getting named in the starting position, um, you know, come the actual final team lists? Or is he actually going to be named on the bench? So the nailed onness of him as a starter is a little bit more up for debate. So I'm a little bit less keen on Baker just for that particular reason. I think Bullimore and King would be my preferred options. I think King, if I was looking for a trade-in this week, would probably be King. Um, and Bullimore maybe would be one I'd want to wait another week on just to see what the output is like again playing the full 80 minutes and also because of that potential early return date for someone like a Josh Schuster. So that's my overall thoughts on that. I definitely think it's okay selling Jermaine Tenor Brown, even though it's only one to two weeks. Um, the base output was fine, 27 base in the 24 minutes that he played. But the rotation risk with Peyton, I'm already a little bit um, off him. And I think if I can create some extra funds to make some upgrades elsewhere in my team, I'm probably okay with doing that move myself this week. So unfortunately, another player that got injured was Sean Russell. He scored a hat-trick, but um, is obviously now going to be out for what looks like three to six weeks. I would ideally want to wait for f uh, better information in terms of the length of that injury layoff, because if it's only for three weeks, then I could definitely see an argument to holding. But if it's longer than that, you know, at 280k, when there's an, some decent other kind of cheapy center wings that we can maybe go for, you kind of want to prioritize the cash generation. So I'm also open to selling Russell, um, you know, say if he misses the th uh, four weeks, I'd probably be then okay with selling. Now, a couple of replacements that I've kind of earmarked here is um, Oliver Gildart from the Tigers and uh, Selwyn Cobbo from the Broncos. So Gildart had a pretty good outing of about 36 points. You know, against the Storm, 36 points from your center wing is not a bad um, output there. And the, the draw does open up nicely for the West Tigers now as well. So they've got the Knights, the Warriors, the Titans, and the Sharks in the next month ahead before the Eels and the Rabbitohs. But then the Eels, they conceded quite a few points to the Titans, um, and Rabbitohs didn't look amazing against the Broncos. And Tigers are a team that I can expect to still score some points. They're just a little bit inconsistent. So I think for a very similarly priced option, I think Gildart could be a way to go, but I don't think it's necessarily a move that you need to rush into, just because you might still have some question marks around Gildart um, and how good of a super coach option he is. If, for example, though, you can make a direct swap from, say, Sean Russell to Selwyn Cobbo, I'm much more keen on doing that move this week, if possible, just because it's the next three games for the Broncos, which is the real money games that you want to target from an attacking perspective. 
you know, the Bulldogs, the Cowboys, and then the Warriors of three very, very nice matchups. So I'm also looking at Selwyn Cobbo this week. I thought he looked really good on the right wing there for the Broncos. I think him and Staggs could have a very deadly partnership, maybe a few points scoring there. And I think the fact that Adam Reynolds should be coming back into the frame in round two means that I've got a little bit more confidence potentially in their attack this week as well. So I think, say for example, two moves that I'm looking at that I'll just discuss a little bit later, you know, Jermaine Chinua Brown down to Josh King, and then Sean Russell up to Selwyn Cobbo. To me, feels like two decent moves where I can get in two players who I think can both either make cash or also deliver good points in the sense of Selwyn Cobbo. So Cobbo is my preference here, but I understand that if you can't stretch up to him, maybe it's worth waiting a week and that also gives you a better sense of maybe Gildart is the better option to go for. But I think if you want to play a little bit more aggressively, I would recommend going for Cobbo from week, um, well, from this week, basically, just because of that nice matchup against the Bulldogs. Now the halves. I really wanted to discuss halves this week because I think a lot of people were put off by the output of Sam Walker, only scored the 24 points, and they were looking at a lot of other halfbacks doing well. I've got Hines, Sexton, Hughes, and Moses listed here, and you can see in the table just below me, they scored pretty well, 72, 61, 103, and 89. And what I've separated out there is the kind of composition of their scoring stats between base, scoring, creativity, and evasiveness. Now, base is obviously our bread and butter, so it's really pleasing to see someone like Nico Hines have such a high base, 36 points. The fact that he scored 72 without any major attacking stats really did look good to me. You know, he would have scored about 52 if you take away that try assist and that line break assist as well. The fact that he's goal kicking, you know, I can see the Sharks scoring two to three tries a game, you know, on average. And so Hines would probably get about 12 points there in addition on, with the goal kicking. So a floor of 50 for Hines, I think is really, really appealing. So I don't mind going for Hines. My overall advice, though, is I probably won't take out Sam Walker this week. I wouldn't advise it just because it seems like it was a bit of an off match for the Roosters. I would expect them to bounce back. And the Eels, uh, sorry, not the Eels, the Sea Eagles. I can see that game being won with a lot of points in it. You know, neither team defended that good last week. So Sam Walker, I think, still could be an option. But I'm considering Hines, definitely. Say, for example, if round two, Sam Walker doesn't look good again. You know, even though the draw from round four does look good, I think Hines has an equally decent draw, at least for the next three. You know, after the Eels, he'll have the Dragons, the Knights, and the Tigers. Does have some tougher matchups against the uh, the Storm and the Sea Eagles. But the fact that we saw a nice base from him and a good floor means I've got a bit more confidence in him in those tougher matchups as well. So Hines is definitely someone I'm very seriously looking at. Uh, Toby Sexton, I think, um, I wouldn't do a downgrade of Walker to Sexton, but as we'll get on in a little bit, if you have Sean Johnson, who is injured, um, my best replacement would be Toby Sexton. Again, he's got a pretty decent floor of 20 in base, plus the goal kicking that he'll get. So, you know, add in around 10 to 12 points in goal kicking, and his floor will be around 32, which is pretty decent. Um, overall, I thought he looked quite good, quite uh, composed as well. And I think the draw for the Titans is pretty decent as well. So I think you're still getting a player who's cheaper than Johnson, you know, frees up some money, and you're capitalizing on a good draw, and he should be a pretty healthy point scorer of around at least minimum of, you know, 35 to 40 points a week, I'd expect. Hughes is a bit of a different case in the sense that he is a lot more expensive as well, in the sense that he's 640k. It's hard to jump on him when you know that he was the main man in that matchup against the Tigers. Now that Grant and Munster are back, you know, how well is he going to go? My thinking is that he probably will go equally as well um, with all of his team back. And the fact that they're probably going to score more points as well means that I think Hughes is a great option to go for. But I guess, my, again, my overall advice, I wouldn't be looking to do these switches from, say, a gun halfback like Sam Walker, just based on one round. I would definitely want it to or give it a week. And I think the benefit is that um, most of these guys, apart from Sexton, don't have the best matchup on paper this round. So I think you can afford to give it a week. Someone like Moses as well has got the Storm in round three. And so I think Moses, you know, you could very easily make a switch to him in, say, round four. I definitely see him more as a kind of a flak track bully. And so, you know, maybe a same walker to switch to uh, Moses in round four could be on the cards. But as you can see there, uh, Walker has got such a good draw from round four onwards. I don't even think you'd be tempted to do it then. So overall, I wanted to do this section just because I think the halves is a topic of discussion. You know, a few people thinking about maybe uh, dropping Sam Walker. My overall advice is not to do it. But I think, look, if you're committed to it, these are some of the options I would consider. I think Hines and Sexton really stood out for me, especially Hines with that really nice floor that he has. And I think if you can stretch up to Hughes, obviously that's going to be a good move. And Moses, I'd probably look to target him more from, say, round four onwards after he's played the Sharks and the Storm. Now, a quick additional discussion point on the 5-8. So Sean Johnson, as we already touched on, is going to be injured for what looks like the next two to four weeks. So to me, he's a sell because you're probably going to be missing these easier games up until round five and six. From round six onwards, you know, if he's back, 
He's going to then be placing the Roosters and the Storm. So to me, Johnson is an easy sell. Now, if you've got him in the 5-8 slot and you can't, say, move to one of those halves that we previously outlined, um, there's some kind of 5 eight options around his price, but not too many. Ideally, you'd be moving to, say, like a Toby Sexton at a similar price. I think I'd be making a switch to Dylan Brown, though. Now, Brown only scored about 40 points on the weekend, but he was shifted to center, and he did look a lot better when he was playing in the halves. Now, they do have, I, th- I can't remember his name um, on the bench, but he should be offering some center coverage if in, in case there's another injury there. So I'm thinking Brown should be in a better position to actually play more in the halves. It's a decent matchup against the Sharks. He's got very good base, so you're not concerned, I think, with having, with him having such a low score. So Johnson to Brown, I think, is probably a move I would do. Now, I know Whiten scored very well on the weekend, and he is very heavily traded in. I just never see Whiten as a great supercoach option. Now, he looked good, don't get me wrong, and it is a good matchup against the Cowboys, but then the run is a bit tougher after that. You know, Sea Eagle, Storm, and the Panthers in three of the next four from rounds four onwards. To me, I'd rather capitalize and say like a Dylan Brown who's got a better long-term draw, and I've just got more confidence in him just because I know he's got better base, and with the addition of a couple of attacking stats, I know he should hopefully deliver some value as well. Now, Clifford, I have seen a few people mention Jake Clifford as well, another goal kicker. The Tigers this week is a good matchup, but I again, I don't want to jump the gun. I think I'd rather just give it a week or two to jump on someone like a Clifford. Now, obviously, you can't do that with Johnson because he's out this week and you want to sell him this week. So Dylan Brown, for me, is the best direct replacement for this week just because I know that he's got the best base out of them and I've got the most confidence in the Eels as a team overall to score points. Uh, but Clifford could be an option that we consider, maybe from, say, round four onwards. But I, I, I wouldn't be jumping the gun on Clifford, in, in all honesty. I think Dylan Brown is probably the way that I would go there. Now, I'm going to be taking a look in this section at the market activity. So looking at the top 10 trades in and the top 10 trades out. Now, in terms of the trades out, I really only think you should be trading out injured players or maybe some of those higher value gun players like, say, a Cody Walker. Um, looking at this list here, a lot of those names make sense to me. You know, Brandon Smith and Johnson, I think, are very easy sells. Sean Russell is a little bit more difficult because he did have a nice score of 87. And, you know, if he's only back in a few weeks, we might want that. But to me, it's it's okay to sell, especially if you can get to someone like a Selwyn Cobbo with a nice uh, three-game stretch. So I'm, I'm okay with that move out as well. Uh, Viliami Velai from the Warriors is a bit more of a difficult one just because of the price tag. 205k, unless you've got a stack of money in the bank, I'm just not sure where you can actually move to. I mean, you could go down to Schiller from the Raiders, but again, I'm I'm concerned that Sebastian Chris could come back any time and completely knock him out of that spot. So I'd probably just be keen to leave Vallejo there, and hopefully you've got enough center wing depth there to cover for him if he was a starter for you, but I don't think many people would have started with him anyway. So while I agree he could be a trade-out, but if you haven't got the money in the bank, I would probably just keen, uh, I would probably lean to just holding him. Jermaine Tinoor Brown could be back in one to two weeks, but I am also thinking about selling him as well. So I do agree with that here on this list. Kiri and Marnie, I really don't agree with. I think if you picked either of these guys to start the year, I think you have to commit to them for a few more weeks. Now, I know a few people might be moving, say, Reed Marnie to Harry Grant, but even Harry Grant, uh, Wishart is on the bench there for the Storm. So uh, Grant might not play the full 80 minutes from the get-go. And so I'd be keen to just wait on that. Um, I think you can very easily play Reed Miney. He had a low score, but it was a very strange game against the Titans. You know, I'm not sure how, if how much tackling he was able to do when both teams were just scoring points. So I'd expect his output to increase a lot more in the next few weeks. So I wouldn't be making that switch. And same with Luke Kiri. I think if you pick someone like Kiri, you've got to stick with him for the for a few weeks at least just to see how he goes. You know, even if, say, another week, if he looks bad, then I'd be okay with selling. But just after one round, to me, it just feels a bit knee-jerky. Ryan Madison, Blake Taff, and Christian Welch, to me, are all very easy sells. Ryan Madison, what well, looks like to be out for two to three weeks. Blake Taff, um, I would never considered him as a buyer in the first place, but he's going to be out for a few weeks as well. Latrell Mitchell's back, so I would not be considering Blake Taff as an option at all. So very easy sell. And Christian Welch, unfortunately, as well, out for the season. So again, that makes a lot of sense. Now, looking at the trades in, um, a few of them do make sense to me, and a few don't. So, Coruscant, I'm not a massive fan on, just because uh, he does seem to pick up a few niggling injuries. And while he played a good game uh, against the Sea Eagles, I'm just not confident how many attacking stats he'll actually get. And my concern with him as well is that once Nathan Cleary is back, I feel like he's going to dominate the possession, he's going to dominate the play, and I feel like that's going to kind of detract away from Coruscant. So, while it could be good for this week, you know, it's a decent matchup against the Dragons, Long term, I'm not sure of that move. And for example, if people are trading Reed Miney out for Coruscant, that's definitely not a move that I would be doing. 
Isaac Targo for me, very obvious buy if you haven't got him. Showed how good of an option he is for Supercoach. He could be a very easy play in our 17s every week as well. Scored the try, a few tackle breaks. Um, looked good on the eye, good base. To me, very easy purchase. Jack Wyden, I do feel like that's a bit reactionary. Um, as I previously discussed, I just don't think he's a great super coach option. Um, not very consistent in my eyes. So I wouldn't be going there. Now, Harry Grant as a buy. Look, if it's a Brandon Smith out for Harry Grant, I think that's a perfectly fine move and I would be doing that. Reed Miney, though, to Harry Grant, I don't think I'd be doing that move because there's still a little bit of a question mark around the minutes that Grant's going to play this week. Now, Payne Haas, I'm very happy that I've started with him in my um, team. I think he's a great buy for front row forward. If you can find a way to get up to him, I, I think he's going to be a great get. Played 71 minutes, um, although Kevy did say that that probably was inflated, and it's more realistically he's going to be playing um, 60 to 65. Look, Payne Haas playing 60 to 65 minutes, I can still see him scoring 70 to 75 a game. I like the fact that he was offloading as well, and I think the fact that he's sub 600k, I feel like that could be the cheapest price all season. So, yep, I 100% agree with that purchase of getting Payne Haas in. Viliami Kikau, not as much of a fan on this. Um, on his day, with those attacking stats, he can get those big scores. But his minutes are always a question mark. He doesn't play the full 80. Can be inconsistent. And so, again, I wouldn't be jumping the gun on this one. I'd much prefer someone like a Josh Curran, who I think longer term is a much more secure super coach option than, say, like a Kikau. Now, I can see the appeal. I personally won't be going there. Will Smith, I don't really get. Um, he only played in that starting 17 because Brimson was out. Brimson's now back at 5'8". So that means Will Smith is on the bench. And so to me, even that 205k, just don't see much value there in terms of cash generation. Coming off, off the bench as a utility, you might score like 15, 20 points. And and again, the round one score is going to drop out first. And so cash generation-wise, not sure how much you're going to get there. Liam Martin, Stephen Crichton, and Mitchell Moses round out the top three. I think Martin is actually a decent get. Played the full 80 minutes, which I think is a good sign. Scored that try. And I think when Nathan Cleary comes back, He'll be running off Nathan Cleary. So I think those attacking stats could be on the cards there for Liam Martin. So I don't actually mind him as a purchase. Crichton, a bit of an iffy one. Obviously does help that he's goal kicking. But when Cleary's back, he's going to lose the goal kicking. And we saw in 2020, he was very reliant on the attacking stats and the tries to keep up the good scores. Now, obviously, the Panthers uh, could be uh, clicking on all cylinders and he could be getting those tries again. But I kind of want to see it again, just because if he has a poor score, there's going to be in his rolling average longer than that good score in round one. So I think the price at 430k, I'd prefer just maybe going a little bit cheaper, would say like a, a Cobo, or I'd actually prefer going with one of the Dragons players. So someone like a Terrell Sloan or a Zach Lomax would probably be my preference there, although I'm a little bit biased to those guys. And Mitchell Moses, I think... Decent buy, but if it's at the expense of someone like Sam Walker, I wouldn't do it. If you're doing a Sean Johnson, though, to Mitch Moses, I think that's a pretty decent move. Now, in this next section, I'm going to be talking about round two captaincy. So captaincy this week is a little bit tougher um, because a lot of the good teams are versing each other. So you've got the Roosters versing the Manly Sea Eagles. Um, you've got the Rabbitohs taking on the Storm. So there's a few of those matchups that are a little bit harder to call. Now, I would be very comfortable actually captaining Pappenhausen, though, just because Nick Meany wasn't named in the 17. He's on the reserves. So I'd expect Pappenhausen to be goal-kicking. He scored 71 last week, or 74, um, I'm not 100% sure. Um, and the fact that he's goal-kicking should hopefully add, you know, 10 to 12 points to that. Um, he looked very involved, a lot of, um, you know, try assists he got there, uh, well, a couple of try assists in that game against the Tigers. The fact that Grant and Munster are back should mean, even if Pappenhausen's not getting those bigger attacking stats like the tries, try assists, you'll at least get some extra goal-kicking points. And the Rabbitohs don't have a very good record um, playing in Melbourne. So I don't mind actually going straight C on Pappenhausen. You could very easily vice-captain him and captain one of those other forwards that I've got listed there later in the week. That's my current tentative plan, is to vice-captain Pappenhausen and then to captain someone like a Fafida or a Payne Haas. But I think there could also very easily be an argument just to straight captain Pappenhausen in the first game of the week. I've got Teddy and Turbo listed as vice-captain and captain options here. Now, Turbo, I think, could be a very comfortable captain if you do have him. Just because the Roosters will concede quite a few points, um, you know, Turbo scored, what, 62 points, and they only scored six points in that game. Just imagine if, say, Manly scored 18 points, you could see Turbo at least getting maybe a try or an extra try assist as well. So he very easily could crack 100. So I think Turbo, if you've got him, I'd be very confident captaining him as well. Now, Teddy, I'm a bit iffy on just because of that performance. It does put me off a little bit. I think Pappenhausen is a better captain option than Teddy this week. So I'd be captaining Pappenhausen over to Desco. And if you're looking later in the week, I think Dave Fafita at home to the Warriors, um, when he was playing last season at the Gold Coast um, venue, he was a lot better in terms of super coach points. Um, you know, he notoriously had that game where he scored a hat-trick against the Rabbitohs. Now, the question mark with him is, you know, sometimes he looks uninvolved, but 
look, he looked uninvolved and he scored 60. So if he's on top of his game in that particular week against the Warriors, he could very easily crack 100. So i am currently got the captain's armband on Fafida and the vice captain on Pappenhausen. And I think Fafida should definitely be a consideration. What puts me off though is that he does tend to sometimes get lost in games. And so I'm never quite certain of what, which game he's going to get those big 100 plus point scores. Now, Nico Hines, I've got his captain as well, just because of the fact that I saw the Parramatta Eels concede like, what, 26 points to the Titans. And I think the fact that he's got a very good floor, as we've discussed, you know, I could very easily see Hines being maybe a safe kind of 75 to 80 points as well, if you've got Hines. And Payne Haas, again, I think a very safe captain option could score you like, you know, 70 to 75 points. And you take that, you know, in any given week. So I think Payne Haas in the last game against the Bulldogs, if, say, for example, you've got Vice Captain Pappenhausen and he just didn't quite hit the heights, I think someone like Fafita or Haas could be safe um, captain options in the forwards. And so for me, my current plan is Vice Captain Pappenhausen and then Captain either one of Fafita uh, or Payne Haas. But if I get any extra news, I'd be keen to also just Captain Pappenhausen straight up in the first game of the round. And so in the final part of the video, I'll just quickly run through my team and what my kind of early thoughts are as well in terms of just general team selection with reserves. Now, I'm not keen on t taking out any of my major gun players. So at the moment, um, I've got Tunnel Brown injured and I've also got Sean Russell and Valaya injured. Now, if I had to, uh, you know, this is kind of what my team set up at, as it stands without having to play Russell or Valaya. Um, I'd be reserving Tedesco, Vice Captain Pappenhausen, Captain's Armband on Fafida. I play Tuolagi, Randall, and Max King, who's named on the bench, which is not ideal. Now, I could very easily just run with that team, but I kind of want to be a bit more aggressive if I can, just because I know like there's some uncertainty around which of the best forward cheapies to go for, but I kind of want to be aggressive just in the early parts of the week, just to kind of set up my team. So what I'm thinking initially is um, taking out someone like Tanua Brown, just for one of those bench cheapies forwards that we discussed. So for example, the player that I'm thinking about uh, is Josh King, just because I feel like he's a bit more secure in terms of the um, you know the minutes that he'll get longer term. I could go for a Bullimore, but I do prefer that saving that I can get on Josh King, and it does let me make a decent upgrade elsewhere, as we will see uh, very soon. So just finding Josh King there, what do you score? 41 points. So I bring in Josh King then, and that leaves me 42k in the bank. Now what I can actually do with that is I can take out Sean Russell, and that lets me get up to Selwyn Cobbo. Now, to me, that seems quite like exciting. Um, I really like that next three-game stretch for the Broncos. And so I could very easily bring in Cobo. And then what I would do there is I'd probably reserve um, Cobo, Tedesco, um, Tulagi, and then Randall. So it doesn't. It means I just don't have to um, you know, reserve Max King coming off the bench. Um, and I don't even have to play Josh King. Now, that leaves me with less money in the bank. But my early thoughts are that next week in rounds three, that's the first round before the price changes happen. So I'll probably want to use three trades and my trade boost just to set up my team. And so because I'm not quite sure what I'll have to do next week, I'm kind of keen to get these moves done just so that I don't have to worry about them next week. And so that means next week, maybe I can just make some bigger upgrades elsewhere in my team. But you can see at the top there, those are the thoughts that I'm thinking of at the moment with trades. I could very easily hold. I'd be keen to see what you guys think in those as well in the comments below. But I think Tanul Brown and Russell Alpha King and Cobo, to me, feel like pretty decent moves overall. But that's it, guys. I'm going to end the video there. Hopefully, you guys found some value out of that. If you did, really appreciate a thumbs up. Do please consider subscribing as well to the channel if you want to see more content like this throughout the season. And I'll see you all in the next video.